Thank you, Richard. What a great truth, great song. I love that. Good music here. You know, as an evangelist, I'm privileged to uh, travel and, and uh, make a lot of good new friends and, and be able to go in different places. And my, my ministry as an evangelist, many times in the summertime, one of the privileges of summer is that I get to travel into uh, various camps and get to preach at uh, good Christian camps all over uh, the country. And I've met some of you uh, at uh, summer camp, different places, and I... I was telling folks last night that uh, one of the thrills of my heart was that during the summer I got to uh, uh, meet a lot of young people that would come up to me and, and tell me they just graduated from high school or whatever the case may be. And then they'd say, I'd say, well, where are you going to be going to college? And I met several young people who said, I'm going to Clearwater Christian College. I said, hey, well, I'll see you there in a, in a few more weeks. And uh, I'll catch you there when uh, when we're there together. And I saw some of you last night, and I appreciate that. If there are others of you that I met this summer, I'd appreciate it if in passing somewhere along the way on the property, you'd just, you know, say howdy and, and shake my hand and remind me of where we met one another and say, when you come up and say, hey, remember me, uh, my typical answer is no. I, I don't remember you. Where did we meet? Because I can't remember where I am half the time and much less where I met somebody. But the truth is I met many of you there. And then at the first of the summer, at the very beginning, I had a great privilege to... Uh, Pull up at my very first camp, a little remote camp out in somewhere in Kansas. I don't even remember where it was, but I pulled up and there was a van there that had the logo on the side of it, or uh, maybe it was the trailer that was with them. It said Clearwater Christian College, and I thought, what in the world are they doing here? And uh, when I when I got out, I found out that the uh, there was a camp team from Clearwater that was there, headed up by John uh, Kiefer and his wife Angela and the the gang that was with them. And, uh, man, they had a great time. I had a great time getting to know them. But the sad thing was I found out that the very next week they were going to be going to another camp, which happened to be the very same week, same camp that I was going to be at. And so uh, they had to endure me two weeks in a row. And uh, I, I, uh, I enjoyed getting to know them. I felt like we were all part of the same team. And uh, it was wonderful. They, they provided great special music. They provided a lot of helping hands. They served as counselors and worked in on the properties, and they just did all kinds of things. And uh, I, I appreciate them. And I just felt like the Lord helped me and get my own heart ready and prepared to come to Clearwater. And uh, I was excited about that privilege. And so, again, if I've met you this summer and we haven't got a chance to see each other yet, please say uh, howdy to me somewhere on the property, would you? And that would be great. I'm looking forward to meeting you. I met several of you last night and a few more this morning. And I know that today is a very busy day, and they've provided me with a quick chance to get up here to the pulpit and get a chance to preach to you, and then we'll get on out of here and get you on uh, down the trail. Now, let me ask you to do something again this morning that I did it last night. Let me ask you to gather your thoughts together. I know that you've got a lot on your mind. Uh, you, you should. <laughs> Somebody said, huh, 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 Well, you should have a lot on your mind right now, and I know you've got a lot to do. And you, maybe you're concerned about getting that schedule just right and concerned about getting all the details of work and class schedules and all the other things on your mind and administration, faculty, and others have a lot going on. Can I ask you just to give me your, your, your attention now for, I don't know, 35 or so minutes and let's let the Lord have our time and attention during these moments, all right? I think that you will. You did last night and I'd appreciate it if you do it again uh, here at this particular time. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 39 with me, if you would. I want to be a help to you in a special way. Genesis chapter 39 takes us to a passage that tells us a part of a story about someone who happens to be one of my favorite Bible characters. Do you, do you have a favorite Bible character? Do you have somebody that is a, it's just, just absolutely one of your favorite Bible characters? I have about... Uh, I don't know, about about 17, I think. Every time I go through the Bible, I, I run across somebody else. I go, wow, I love this guy. This is a great story. This is a good one. You know, you keep going through the Bible and you keep reading these favorite Bible stories. And this is certainly one of them. And I don't have time to go through the whole story about this particular person. But most of you would be familiar with this guy's life. His name is Joseph. Joseph is certainly one of my favorite Bible characters. Man, what a story. What an absolute fantastic story we have here. And I can't say a whole lot for us this morning that, that you've not heard about or thought on before. And, 
there's not a lot I can remind you about here that you've probably not thought about before. Let's have a very quick review, even before we read Genesis 39. Here's a boy who grew up in a home that would be what we would, if, if they were alive today, we would certainly call this family a dysfunctional family. I mean, they had problems, man. I mean, first of all, his dad had, uh, in, in a real sense, he had four wives. I mean, there were children born from these four women. And they were all there at the same time. I mean, it wasn't like he married one and then got rid of her and then brought in wife number two and then got rid of her and then brought in three. And, and then, No, no. They were all there at the same time. I mean, you talk about conflicts. You talk about jealousies. You talk about difficulties. I mean, I'm telling you, they had, a, they had a hard time. Listen, if this family was alive today, I'm sure they'd wind up in one of those silly TV programs where... Um, I don't watch these things, but these programs where everybody sits on the platform together and they yell at each other and they throw chairs at one another and they fight at each other, you know. I mean, Joseph's family was a mess. It was an utter mess. I mean, he had all these brothers, 11 older brothers than he, and then he comes on. And Joseph, Joseph got all this treatment of favoritism from daddy. And the reason why was because Joseph was born from his daddy's favorite wife. I, I mean, what a mess. He had four wives, and he finally, his, 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 uh, his, the wife he really loved finally gave birth to Joseph. So Joseph, being the baby, and being the one born from his favorite wife, got all this favoritism treatment. You remember, you, you heard this when you were a little kid in Sunday school, he got a coat of many colors. And every time he'd walk around, you know, his brother saw him in that little special daddy's favorite coat, and and, and they just wanted to, you know, they wanted to pull his lungs out, you know. I mean, they just got, they got, put, they got put out with Joseph. And Joseph didn't have to work as much as his brothers, I'm sure. His brothers were out there in the hot sun of the day, and they're out there working, blazing around in the, in the, uh, on the farm or the, the property, working with cattle and, and maybe rebuilding fences and all kinds of things. And here comes Joseph, you know, about, maybe about 11 o'clock. He just got up. You remember those days? Yeah. By the way, those are in your past now. I want you to know. I mean, he'd, come, he'd get up about 11 o'clock, and maybe noon. He'd come walking out. He's still wiping stuff out of his eyes, you know. He's still got a little Captain Crunch hanging out of his mouth. And, and he goes, hey, brothers, how y'all doing? What's going on? And, they, and they're thinking, nah. he doesn't have to work like we do. And then Joseph comes out and he goes, hey, guys, let me tell you about this dream I had last night. And every time I get to that portion of the scripture, I want to say, you know, you know, Joseph, keep it to yourself, you know. I mean, don't tell that dream. You're not going to help your situation at all. He'd say, hey, guys, I had this dream last night. We were all a bunch of stars. Isn't that crazy? He goes, and then, and then, and then my star would rise above everybody else, and all you guys would bow down to me. Well, wasn't that a great dream? And they're thinking, I'll kill him. Who does he think he is? We're not going to bow down to him. He thinks he's somebody special. He's crazy. Finally, one day, Joseph goes out looking for his brothers. In fact, he was obeying his dad. His dad sent him out to find them. They were probably, they were a good 50 miles away from home. And he goes wandering around looking for them and gets directions as to where they wound up at. And, and they see him coming. And as they see him coming down the trail, they see probably that special coat. And they say, here comes that dreamer. And one of the brothers says, let's kill him. Now, I'm not talking about killing like you said about your brother when you were a little kid. You know, I'm, I'm going to kill you. No, no, they really meant we'll kill him. You say, well, I meant that too. No, no, you didn't. They said, we're going to kill Joseph. And they tried to figure out the best way to get rid of him. And when Joseph showed up at their camp, they grabbed him. They stuck him down in some kind of a pit. Some kind of a sister and some kind of an old pit, and they and above his head, as he listened to his brothers talk, he could hear them talking. You know, what's the best way to kill him? Now I'm having to read between the lines. The scriptures don't tell us this, but no doubt they were sitting around thinking, you know, should we just slit his throat? Maybe we ought to just bury him alive. Maybe we ought to just bury him up to his up to his neck and let animals come along and eat his head. You know, I mean, you know, they probably thought all kinds of horrible things. Can you imagine being stuck down in this hole listening to your brothers talk like that? But all of a sudden they saw some, some Ishmaelites traveling down the highway. And these were like tradesmen. Now, now stay with me. I know you know this story. 
See, these were like gypsies. They went from place to place selling things. And here they are traveling down the highway, this caravan of Ishmaelites, Midianites. And they go, hey, you, you gypsies, come here. And they, get, they said, hey, look here, we got this slave boy. They pulled him out of the pit. They said, hey, what would you give us for this kid? You know, he was probably around 17 years of age at the time. They said, what would you give us for this kid? Strong kid. And they paid 20 pieces of silver. And at this point, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how Joseph traveled. He may have been thrown in the back end of some wagon. He may have ridden on a camel, neither of which I really believe happened. Probably what happened is they probably put a leash around his neck. And he probably walked the rest of the way down to Egypt like an animal. And here Joseph gets into a strange country he's never been in in his life. People talk a different language he doesn't understand. He's long, far away from home. Nobody loves him there. Nobody knows him there. And he feels absolutely lost. And that's where we pick up the story in Genesis 39, beginning in verse 1. Follow along with me as I start reading in verse 1. The Bible simply says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. We'll stop reading right there, but keep your Bibles open to Genesis 39. Bow your heads with me, please, for one more word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the Bible and for the opportunity to preach it to these, my new friends. And I pray that in this chapel time this morning, this very special conference time, that you'll do a special work in our heart that only you can do. Lord, continue to lead, and I pray that... uh, You'll just take complete control. Don't let me interrupt anything you want to do in anyone's heart here today. Thank you for speaking to hearts last night, and no doubt in other uh, times alone with you, you've spoken to your people today. But I pray that in these moments together, you'll do that once again. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I get upset, young people, when I think about how often you've been lied to through the years. You, you've been lied to even in recent months, and in many cases you don't even recognize it. You and I have been lied to for so many years that we don't even pick up on it anymore most of the time. We don't see it. We've been blindsided for so long through commercials and advertisers that we don't even recognize their lies anymore. In fact, I mean, you've grown up be- believing certain things that really aren't true. When you reached into your teenage years, there were, there were certain things that you thought you needed to have in order to be considered somebody cool. If you really wanted to be a success, you needed to have a certain type of, you know, clothing. Or your car needed to be a certain style. And now in college, as you reach this young adult years, you, you find yourself still being bombarded with, uh, lies. Really. I mean, we, you and I have been told for years that your clothing needs to have a certain logo on it. Now, I'm not preaching against any particular logos, but I mean, we, we've been taught that if you're really going to be somebody cool, you got to have, you know, you got to have Mr. Tommy, you know, go figure on there if you're really going to be somebody. You got to have Calvin Klein on some logo somewhere, or you're really a loser. No, you're not. And some ball team thinks that, you know, some ball player thinks he's really not going to be somebody unless. 
there was a swoosh on his shoe, you know. He, and he'll say to his dad or his parents, you know, Dad, I got I got to have these, you know, Nike Air, you know, Jordos or whatever. I got I got to have these things because I mean it'll make me jump higher and I'll run faster and I'll play better. Maybe not. It may just help you look a lot better as you sit on the sideline watching everybody else play. You know, I mean that may that may be all that it accomplishes. When I was in high school, public high school, they used to give out awards every year. I never thought about these things until at the end of the year we'd get our yearbook. And I'd go through the yearbook and I'd look at pictures. And, and that little certain section of the yearbook, they gave out awards, you know. Most athletic. I never I never got that one. Uh, uh, best school spirit. Uh, best personality. They always gave it to some girl that was a little, you know, a little dizzy. Uh, uh, she was... Uh, a great personality. She just didn't know who she was, but I mean, you know, I mean, she's just a little dizzy, but she had a great personality. And don't don't look at anybody when I say that, would you? I mean, just uh, just keep looking this way. Uh, and and they give out all these awards, you know, uh, uh, best looking and and most beautiful, and all these silly awards they give away in the in the public high school system. And then you turn the page in your book, and there'd be a picture, and it'd be a guy and a girl, and it'd say most likely to succeed. Now, every high school would be different, I'm sure, and they'd have different criteria for making those selections. But in my high school, they always seemed to give that award to the guy and the girl that was so brilliant, they were so highly intelligent that it was just assumed <laughs> they'd be a success for the rest of their life. I mean, I mean, they, they were walking computers. I mean, they just kind of walked around. They were on another planet. They were somewhere else. Uh, one boy that would always receive that award was a guy. I mean, in between classes, you'd see him walking across the school campus reading a book. I mean, you know, he, he had no good people skills. He'd run in. He looked, I saw him one day run into a pole because he was so busy running uh, reading his book. He was somewhere else. Brilliant. These were the kids that, that were so smart that they got upset, you know, when they, when they missed the bonus question. On the chemistry final exam, you know, they they, they made a hundred in, instead of a hundred and five, and they get upset about it. You know, I just wanted to spell chemistry right and move on, you know, and get get on down the road. You've been lied to. You got to have certain type of clothing. You got uh, you got to have certain type of cologne. Now, one of the silliest commercials I've ever seen in my life was this commercial where some strong, muscular guy. And they get some great muscular guy. Hey, his shirt's off so you can see all those muscles, the rippling, you know, but they airbrushed on him. And, uh, and they, they got him looking. I mean, he's just one strong muscular kid. He would remind you a lot of, I mean, just very muscular kid. He would remind you a lot of, uh, never mind. He was just a real, I'm just joking. He's just a strong, and they put him on a horse. And he's riding this horse along the side of, a, of, a, of an ocean. And, and as he's riding along, you see the water lapping against the shore behind him. And all of a sudden, he reins up on the horse. This is a cologne commercial. You, you want to know what the guy really smells like right now? He's got his shirt off. He's under the hot sun. And, and he's riding the horse. The guy stinks, man. I'm telling you, but this is a cologne commercial. He pulls up on the horse. He looks over among the trees. And out from behind the trees steps this girl. Long, flowing hair. She's got a faraway look. She's kind of got the look of maybe, she's got the IQ of maybe... Uh, 12. And the next thing you see, she's on the horse with him, and they're riding off together in the sunset. And you say, Woo! I gotta get that cologne, man. I mean, look what happens when you wear that cologne. You know, muscular, horse, girl. Woo! I gotta have this thing. You've been lied to. And sometimes you have been told through the years that you've got to have certain things in your life if you're really gonna be considered a success. Now listen to it. Your car has got to be a certain expensive style, or you're really a loser. i got news for you. That has nothing to do with having the blessing of God. You've got to have a certain type of clothing. You've got to have a certain type of intellect or education behind you. A certain title next to your name. You've got to have a certain amount of money, or you're really a loser. Let me tell you something, young people. All that is a lie of the devil. I mean it. The devil has made his business successfully at the er in the area of lying. He has lied for years. To get us off track from focusing upon Bible success. Now, if you put a nickel down for every sermon you've ever heard in your lifetime, especially as a young person, and now in your young adult years, if you put a nickel down for every sermon you've ever heard about being really a success, you'd probably be very wealthy. 
You can just stack this one up with the other ones this morning. I want to, I want to take us back real quickly to see what the Bible says about real success. At first glance, it looks like Joseph's life is an utter failure. Bad home, brothers hated him, shown favoritism by daddy, thrown in a pit, pulled out, sold up into slavery. Now he's in Egypt. He's been purchased by this uh, high-rolling official in Egypt by the name of Potiphar. He, he's a slave for this man. You know, at first glance, it looks like Joseph is a loser. Now listen to me. The truth of the matter is, if you think that, then you weren't listening to what we read just a moment ago. Because we read something very clearly that was stated about this man's life, and I want you to see it again. Look at verse 2 of Genesis 39. It simply says, and, he, and the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a prosperous man. Verse 3. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Verse 4. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house. Now he's, now he's the number one servant. He's in charge of the whole house. Verse 5. And it came to pass from the time that he made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. Now, we didn't read this, but I want you to go all the way to the end of the chapter, verse 20. Joseph has been lied about. You would remember that, probably. He's been put in prison by Potiphar because of Potiphar's wife who lied. She said that Joseph raped her. He did not. He didn't even touch her. It says in verse 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. All right, now he's gone from being a slave. He, he went to being a head of the slave. And now he is in a prison. You say, yeah, he's a loser. No, sir, look at verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. <laughs> and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his or Joseph's hand, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Young people, I believe I can show you seven times in chapter 39 alone where the Bible refers to the blessing of God upon Joseph's life. Let me tell you something, this boy was not a loser, he was not a failure, he had something special going on in his life that you can't find in a makeup kit, you can't find in a cologne bottle, you can't find it with a logo, you can't find it with a hefty checking account, you can't find it with a nice vehicle. i got news for you, Joseph had none of those things. He didn't have some fancy chariot, he didn't have any swoosh on his sandals, he didn't have any, he didn't have any logo on his attire. He didn't have anything special about him, but he had the power and blessing of God upon his life. And it was not a mistake. Everywhere he went, there was something different about Joseph. You know what Clearwater Christian College and every class would be in dire need of? You say, you don't know our school. You don't know. I'd say this no matter where I am. You know what this world is in desperate need of? Some Joseph Christians. Some people who, knows, who know what it is to have the blessing of God upon their life. And it shows. Everywhere they go. What was it that made Joseph a winner, if you please? What was it that made him prosperous? What was it that made him a success? It had nothing to do with his bank account, his clothing, the crowd he kept, his heritage, his popularity. He had something else going for him. And I want you to see it again one more time. Look at verse 2. It says, that, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. Verse 3, And his master saw that the Lord was with him. Verse 23, The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Over and over and over again, the Bible draws a strong correlation. If you don't get anything else, get this. The Bible continues to refer to the fact that prosperity came to Joseph because connected with it was simply this. The Lord was with him. 
Joseph was with the Lord, and the Lord was with Joseph, therefore Joseph had a blessing in his life that you can't find any other way. The Lord was with him. And Joseph was with the Lord. Young people, can I describe it to you like this in very simplistic terms? Let me put my hand up here as, as representing God and another hand representing Joseph. And here's the case. God and God and Joseph were together. Joseph was with the Lord. There was a weaving of life. There was a weaving of heartbeat, if you please, that Joseph had with the Lord. I got news for you. It it's not hard for me to comprehend why. He was a long way from home. No doubt there were nights of loneliness. No doubt there were some times of homesickness. No doubt there were some times in which he felt mistreated. No doubt there were times in which he felt like nobody understood who he was and what he was all about. And he felt all alone and his surroundings were totally different. Do you feel that way? You feel like you're kind of in a strange place. You've not been in a place like this ever. And for others of you who've been here before, it's still a different surrounding, a different setting, because every school year has a different personality to it. Joseph said, Joseph said, this is not my home. But I'll tell you how he made it, young people. He was with the Lord. There was a witness in his life. In fact, in the original writing of this passage, you'll find the name of Jehovah, God, and Joseph, you'll find their names were literally banked up next to each other. We read it in the English language. It simply says, And the Lord was with Joseph, and Joseph was a prosperous man. Now, that's good reading in our English Bible. But in the original writing, literally the name Jehovah and Joseph were banked up next to each other. In fact, they were woven together. There was a strength to Joseph's life that was wrapped up in the fact that he was wrapped up in God. And people, when will, we, when will we fully comprehend that the Bible is telling the truth when it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of bad attitudes, the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. For then he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf, that which is visible, his leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Jesus said in John 15 and verse 5, He said, If you abide in me and I in you, the same will bring forth much fruit. Then he said, For with Without me, you can do nothing. Some people look at me and listen with both ears wide open. If you spend your time here this year or any year in this Christian college, or if you spend the rest of your life depending upon your personality, you're only going to go as far as your personality will take you. If you depend upon your intellect, you're only going to go as far as your intellect will take you. If you depend upon your academic excellence and your educational background, you're only going to go so far. You depend upon your money, you're only going to go so far. You depend upon your heritage, you're only going to go so far. You depend upon your, your uh, training and your good people skills, you're only going to go so far. You depend upon your athletic abilities, you're only going to go so far. But brother, when you walk with God, there's no end to the success and blessing that you can have. No matter where Joseph went, he had the hand of God upon him. He was with the Lord when he was a servant. When somebody told him what time to get up, does that sound familiar? When someone told him what time to go to bed. When someone told him what he was going to do during the day. As a servant, they then put him over the whole household. They said, here, Joseph, here's the keys to the place. And, and here's the checkbooks or whatever they have where they ran the finances. Here, you just, you'd be in charge of the thing, would you? Just take over. You just tell everybody what they're going to do. And you'd be in charge of all the servants in the home. And, and you just kind of run the place. Here, it's all in your hands, Joseph. And he winds up in prison because of because of, uh, uh, of allegations that were not true. And there, as soon as he gets in the prison, they note that there's something different about this prisoner. And all of a sudden, the prison keeper walks over and says, Here, Joseph, I know you're a prisoner, but here's the keys to the place. Just be the warden, would you? Just, just, just keep an eye on everything. We'll we just let you run the place. I got news for you. Wherever Joseph went, there was a special blessing upon his life. Look at verse 3. This is the third time for me to read this to you. 
Look at verse 3. Don't miss this. It says, And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Who was his master? It was Potiphar. Now, here was a man who had been raised in the Egyptian economy who knew nothing. Are you listening? He knew nothing. Zero with that race about Jehovah God. He didn't know anything about God. These people worship the sun. They worship the moon. They worship the galaxies above their head. They worship animal life. They had all kinds of other gods in their life. And here comes into his world. Here comes into his domain this guy, this teenager, this young man named Joseph who literally impacted the kingdom. He comes into his world, and Joseph has a walk, listen, with God that caught the master's eye. The master didn't even know who God was. The truth is, he no doubt probably one day simply said, Hey, Joe, come here. You're not like any other servant we've got around here. I've already let you be in charge of the place. Could you tell me, what is it that makes you kick? What is it that you've got going for you? I see the word see that, that he saw. The, when verse 3 says the master saw, the word saw there means to inspect. It wasn't just a casual glance. It started with that, but it delved into the idea of a deep inspection. He said, I see something really different about you. What is it? And Joseph said, It's my God. It's my God. I, There's a relationship here, Master, that you don't know about. Can I ask you something? Would there ever be anybody... You're going to have a job here in town somewhere. Wherever you work, will there be anybody that you work with that's going to say, you know something? I mean, there's something different about you. You know, hey, hey, young lady, could you just... Could you tell me you you have a countenance that I don't have from any other of my workers? Hey, hey, young man, I... I get something out of you that I don't get out of anybody else, and it it seems to be genuine. There's some real depth to your life that I don't see in the typical person. What is it? Matthew, are you going to turn any heads? You say, well, I'm working on it. No, I'm not talking about that kind of turning heads. I'm talking about a Bible turn. For without me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. Real quickly. Real quickly, let me simply say that to be with the Lord means, number one, to be with Him in a relationship. I would suppose this is a subject that I don't have to spend a long time on, but the truth is there could be somebody that's attending here at this school. You've come here for the academic excellence that is found at Clearwater Christian College, and I I congratulate you for that choice, but maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe that's even a foreign subject that I'm speaking of. You've been religious, but you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You'll never be with Him until you cross that line and say, I want Him to be my Savior. The Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. John 12 verse 1 says, But as many as received Him... To them, He gives the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Have you done that? Are you with Him? John, 1 John chapter 5 says, And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this eternal life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath eternal life. But he that hath not the Son of God hath not eternal life. But this witness with the Lord starts with knowing Him as your Savior. Do you have Christ? Is He your Savior? You say, preacher, I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, then can we help you? We'd love to help you understand that this thing about being a student at a Christian college does not make you a Christian. That is, it does not prepare you for heaven. You need to accept Christ as your Savior. You need to understand that you're a sinner. God is holy and cannot allow sin into heaven. And therefore, you need to accept the saving work of Jesus Christ to forgive you of all your sins. I encourage you to talk to a roommate, to a teacher. I'd be glad to sit and talk with you, an administrator, somebody that you've known and you've come to know while being here, and let us talk to you about being with the Lord in relationship. But let me say in closing, not only are you to be with Him in a relationship, but secondly, to be with Him in fellowship. 
And that's for every one of those who know Christ, which is the vast majority of you here. Look, young people, some of you have been raised in a Christian home, but you're not with the Lord in a close fellowship. You know who you are. Some of you have attended a, a Christian school, or you've had a Christian school education and homeschooling, or whatever the case may be, but it's a choice that you have to make to be with the Lord, to walk with the Lord. Are you with Him? You say, well, I've been so busy. i got news for you. You're not headed for success. You're headed for loss. You're headed straight for Loserville, if you please, if you continue to walk without a close fellowship with your God. You say, all right, go ahead. Tell us we're supposed to have devotions every day. Young people, having devotions every day is simply the elementary school of what I'm talking about. It's the kindergarten class. I'm not just talking about having a required time in which you sit down and read a chapter or two and you can go over and check off a, a little chart and say, okay, I've read my chapter for the day. No, sir. I'm talking about being walk, intimate and walking close with your God. But you know Him. My wife and I have been married for 28 years. You know, sometimes I can simply look at her and say, you're not feeling very well, are you? Are you all right? What's on your mind? What are you thinking about? Why? Because we know each other. We've been together for 28 years. And the point of the matter I'm trying to say is this. When you walk close with your God, there's a sensitivity. You hear His voice. You know Him. Some people, I, if you don't get anything else, hear me. You get this. While we're here these days, I'm pleading with you to come know God. You get to know your God. And the devil says, you're too busy. You're going to be in Bible class. You don't have time to spend time in the Word of God. You don't have time not to be in the Word of God. Young people, may I plead with you to understand this matter of being with the Lord will make a vast difference in every relationship that you have. You'll not be the roommate you need to have until you, first of all, are walking with God. You'll not be the friend you ought to be until you're, first of all, with the Lord. You'll not be the student you ought to be until you're, first of all, with the Lord. The most important, the most dynamic, the ultimate expression that ought to be said about your life is this. You know what? The Lord's with that guy. You know what? That girl, that girl's got the hand of God on her life. The ultimate expression that ought to be ever said about you or me should be, the Lord is with him. You'll not find this in some makeup kit. You'll not find this in some weightlifting program. You'll not find this in some academic titles. You find it in walking with your God. I've told this story all over the country. And there are kids and people in this room that have heard me tell it. Just smile at me, would you? Act like you never have. Years ago, right here in the state of Florida, when I was a youth pastor here, I got a call from a friend that asked me to come and preach at a, uh, at a retreat, a winter retreat. Now, this is where you want to come for a winter retreat down here. You know, it's a place to come. And it was up around Ocala area or somewhere, Central Park, Leesburg. I forget, I forget exactly where the camp was, but a friend that was a youth pastor in another state um, had rented out this campsite. And he brought his youth group, a sizable youth group. And he asked me if I'd come and preach, and I said, sure, I'd be glad to. I was already here in the central area over here in Tampa, and I said, be glad to. And so I, uh, I, I drove up, in, it was uh, near the end of December, in between Christmas and New Year's, this winter retreat he was having. I was going to preach three or four times, I can't remember. My first service was a morning service like this. And I got up and made some comments to the young people about how glad I was to be there, looking forward to getting to know them, and so forth. And, and I said, by the way, you sang so well this morning. I love to hear teenagers sing, I, I went on to say. And I do. I love to hear young people sing. When I got through, I got through preaching that first service, there was a man there that, that had a little ensemble of young people that sang. And when he heard me make that comment about how much I enjoy hearing teenagers sing and young people sing, he thought to himself, you know, we don't have any special music lined up for this retreat, and we need to. So at the end of that first service, he stood up and he said, Young people, those of you who are in the ensemble, please meet with me this afternoon. We're going to get a special song ready to sing in the evening service tonight. 
And I thought to myself, well, that's neat. I appreciate him doing that. And that afternoon, I was out hanging around. We were throwing footballs and frisbees and hanging around with kids. And I, and I heard music coming out of the little chapel built. I stepped in a side door and I sat, in off, sat down off to the side just listening. I just wanted to listen to them practice. Now, music rehearsals drive me crazy. Now, they just drive me crazy. I know that they have their place, how they go, but they just drive me crazy because they start and they stop. They start and they stop. And they, they got to work all the kinks out. I understand that. It drives me batty. I love to hear the finished product. I mean, you know, there was, you know, the director was down here, and on the platform was about 12 to 15 teenagers standing in a semicircle practicing, and, and, and he would start leading them in the song, and all of a sudden he'd stop, and he'd say, okay, wait a minute, sopranos, you're not blending, let's work on your blend. Right, let's try it again. You know, amazing grace. Okay, wait a minute. Altos, you don't have your note. Can we have that note again? Ding, 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 ding. ding. Yeah, that's it. Let's try it again. Amazing. Okay, guys singing bass, maybe you ought to uh, just leave the room. All right, let's try it again. You know, and I kept thinking, just sing the song, would you? And I'm sitting there off to the side listening to them sing. And about that time, the youth pastor who had invited me to come came in and sat down beside me. And while he was sitting there, I leaned over to him and I said, Hey, I said, that, that, that second girl up there on the, on the right, I said, I bet you you wish you had a hundred girls like her, don't you? He said, Which one? I said, The second one up there on the right. I didn't want to point. So I, I was, you know, doing the elbow thing. I said, You know, right, right up there, the one up there. Uh, in the in the blue or whatever, I said. I said, I bet you you wish you had a hundred girls like her. He said, Oh man. He said, If I had a hundred girls like her, he said, my community would never be the same. He said, Brother Morris, you wouldn't believe. He said, I'm telling you. He said, She is an absolute jewel. I said, Yeah. We sat back and listened. About a minute passed, and my friend hit me in the shoulder, and he said, Hey, wait a minute. He said, Have you met her? I said, who? He said, the second girl on the right up. The one we're talking about. I said, no. I haven't met her. Who is she? He said, you mean you haven't even talked to her yet? I said, no, I haven't talked to her. What's her name? He said, her name's not important. He said, tell me, how could you sit here and tell me that I, as a youth pastor, would love to have a hundred girls like her when you've not even talked to her? How could you say that? I said, my friend, are you so close to the situation you can't really clearly see? I said, look up there. I said, look at that girl. I said, can't you see? She's not just singing notes. She's not just working on her blend. She's not just working on the enunciations. She's not just working on music dynamics. I said, look at the girl. I said, she's singing about somebody that she knows very well. He looked back up and he said, yeah, I see what you're saying. I was at another Christian college a few months. Actually, it was about a year or two later. I was standing in a snack area. A young lady came up and she said, oh, oh, she said, you don't remember me. But I said, I remember you. She goes, how do you remember? I said, you were at a winter retreat in Central Florida. She goes, yeah, but she goes, I never met you. I said, yeah, I know. But I remember you. I said, what are you doing here? She said, I'm learning what God wants me to become. I said, what's he, what's he getting you prepared to do? She said, I believe God's calling me to be a missionary. And I said, I'm not surprised. And she walked away unsure as to how I knew so much about her and how I could remember her. But I never forgot her. Because the girl had the presence of God in her life. Is there a Joseph in this school? I'm sure there is. Is there a Joseph in your dorm hallway? I hope there is. Is there a desire in your heart to be with the Lord? To know Him? And to change your world as a result of being with the Lord. Let's bow our heads for prayer. I'm not going to give a come forward invitation. Time's gone. I just want to want to ask a question real fast. How many of you this morning would say, Brother Gleiser, I needed this today. 
I want my walk with God to be so real. And I want it to be so so definite. So intimate. I want it to be the number one relationship in my life. You'd say, Brother Gleiser, pray for me. I needed this message today. I want my walk with God to be evident. In my life. Please pray for me. Would you raise your hand across the room? I truly want that. God bless you. Wonderful. Many, 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 many hands. In the quietness of your heart right there, would you tell the Lord what He's laid on your heart? I don't like to just give you a place to pray right there. I'd love for you to come and kneel, but time won't allow it right now. God's spoken to you. You take the time with the Lord right now and say, Oh God, I want to be with you. Let me ask one more fast question. Would there be anyone here today who would say, Preacher, I don't think that if I died today I'd go to heaven. I don't know what it means to be 100% sure in my heart that I'm on my way to heaven. I don't know what it means to be with the Lord in a relationship. Hey, Preacher, pray for me. I want to go to heaven, but I'm not real sure that I know that I'm going. Please pray for me. Would you lift up your hand? I'll just see it. You can put it back down. He'd say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I'm not real sure. Just hold it up. I'll wait just another second or two. Anyone at all? Preacher, pray for me. God bless you. I see that hand. Thank you. I'm glad I waited. Wonderful. I'll pray for you. Anyone else? I'd say to anyone here today, such as this one and any others, please get help. Let us help you today. Let us show you how you can know in your own heart that you're on your way to heaven and Christ has saved you. And get that secured in your life today. Father, thank you for allowing us to be together in this service today. And I pray that in the quietness of this time that there will be young people all over this room saying, Oh God, I want to know you intimately. I want to know you better. I want to be a Joseph type Christian. Oh God, I want to know what it is to be with the Lord. And I want, to, I want to impact my world as a result of my closeness with you. And I pray, Lord, that you'll be with, least, with at least one here today who's not sure they're on their way to heaven. Help them to get help today. Let us be able to show them today what it means to know that they're on their way to heaven. Have Christ as their Savior. And we ask for your special blessing on the continuance of this day. May your presence be felt in everything that's said and done. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.